here in Waco, Texas at Floyd Casey Stadium on homecoming weekend for the number 22 Baylor Bears. They play host to the TCU Horn Frogs. The sun desperately trying to peek through. We have already had some light showers this morning in Central Texas, and the forecast is it may reappear throughout the afternoon. We think we're going to find out a lot about both these teams today, whether Baylor can rebound from their recent two-game losing streak and whether TCU can render their recent mid-season history a thing of the past. Here's what is going to happen to TCU. We know this. They have this schedule remaining, SMU, A&M, Texas, and Houston. Here's what usually happens when they reach late October and November. Dave, how can they make it different this year? Well, Dave, the first thing they can do is have a better attitude, and they do have that. They're saying, hey, these records were from former players. Don't judge us by this tradition. Just look at our schedule after November, what our record is. One reason I think they have that confidence this year is after Clay went down to quarterback, little to no drop-off with Tim Shea. I think that's the most amazing plus for TCU this season is the fact that Shade has come in, and as you say, no drop-off. Great poise as he stands back in the pocket. This week for Grant Taft, got to be his toughest coaching job of the year. Two weeks ago, number eight, the front runners for the Cotton Bowl, probably out of the Cotton Bowl now. How does his psyche turn around this week? Well, Grant Taft realizes they had great distractions the last two weeks. And he said this, he said to his team, we've got to get back to the basics. We've got to play hard-nosed football. He scrimmaged both Tuesday and Wednesday and even scrimmaged the kicking game live on Thursday. So I look for a much more improved and much more aggressive Baylor football team today. But they probably will not have Robert Strait, the big sophomore fullback, who injured an ankle against a and last week. That means Tim, uh, John Henry, who gives up about 60 pounds at that position. Well, he's got to pick up a lot. And two weeks ago when Fred uh, Goldsmith came in here and faced him, he said, hey, I'd rather face Robert Strait than John Henry. We think this is going to be an interesting ball game today. PCU and Baylor, we are back after this from Southwest Airlines. Homecoming crowd expected to near the 40,000 mark at Floyd Casey Stadium. It holds almost 49,000. Deep receiving for TCU, Toby Morey is on the left. And true freshman Jimmy Oliver from Dallas Adamson is on the right. Jeff Ireland, the senior from Abilene Cooper, will kick off for the Bears. And with a strong south wind behind him, he puts this well beyond Morey and the Frogs will set up first and ten at their own 20 behind redshirt freshman Tim Shade from Pekin, Illinois. 30 of 47 at Rice last week, the season numbers you see. And the most impressive number is that 66% completion rate, which leads the Southwest Conference. Along with Shade, the offensive unit in our NCNB starting lineup for the Frogs, David Lewis gets the start at slot back. Richard Woodley, great receiver at that position, out three weeks with a fractured left elbow. Breedlove anchors the front line. And maybe the best receiving crew in the country for TCU. They go on the ground to Curtis Modkins, who this year, like last year, is fourth in the Southwest Conference rushing stats, 893 yards a year ago. Here's the front line that he will face for Baylor, as always, led by Santana Dotson, the Lombardi and Outland Trophy candidate from Houston Yates. Lachey Maston, the junior from Dallas Carter, who leads with 75 tackles, this Baylor defense, and Keith Caldwell, the free safety with three interceptions, will be a very busy man today, as will the entire secondary for Baylor. All day for Shade. Finally, it's the tight end, Kelly Blackwell, and he'll have the first down at the 34-yard line. Blackwell, possibly the best tight end in America, the senior from Fort Worth, Richland. And let's check our Southwest Airlines team must for TCU. Well, if TCU can read the blitz and give Shade time, they feel they can go long and burn it, Dave. TCU also must control both the pass rush and the strong rush of, rush of this defense to win this football game. And most coaches complain about a team that nickels and dimes them to death. But Jim Wacker would love to see a team nickel and dime because he knows he's avoided the big play. Frogs came out in the bowl that time, and they split three receivers oh, left and give to Modkins on the draw play, which fooled no one and picked up at most a yard. Modkins, a junior from nearby Marlin, not recruited by Baylor, and Taps says maybe I should have. He's turned into a pretty good bat. 5'10", 190-pounder will go out. More pressure on his shoulders today without Woodley, and also without Derek Cullors, who has been an outstanding freshman 
almost a designated scorer for TCU. Four games of two touchdowns for Colors. He's out for maybe two, three weeks with an ankle. Again, Shade, plenty of time, and he throws incomplete, intended for David Lewis. Lewis replacing Woodley, who was out three weeks with a fractured left elbow. Those two costly injuries in the Frogs' victory last week over the Rice Owls. Well, Grant Papp approaches this game saying this team is in a very fragile state. There's no question that TCU is the game of the year for Baylor right now. I think that was emphasized by the fact that he scrimmaged twice this week, Dave. You just never do that during the regular season. Third and nine. Here comes the Baylor Blitz and Shade incomplete in the general neighborhood of Michael Jackson, but a flag is down. Oh, and if you're Baylor, Coach Grant Tapp, where that flag was thrown, it is almost always roughing the quarterback. He will not like that one. That was on a third and nine, and the frog drive remains alive. First down. Well, you saw what Grant Half thought coming into this game. Well, Ackers, this is not the biggest game in the history of the world, maybe for Baylor, the way Grant's talking. But is he, he says, they're not looking at it that way. You think he is uh, whistling through the graveyard? Right I, there? I certainly think he is. When I was in his office yesterday, I mean, you know, he's one that shows his emotions all the time. He said, this is high stakes. This is big. I mean, you know, he had the arms flailing around. So he knows the importance of this game also. Shade audibleizing with nobody behind him. And again, the Bears blitz. The blitz is burned. Kyle McPherson to the Baylor 38-yard line, the sophomore from Tomball. Dave, one of the things that they have got to do, we talked about, was picking up that blitz. Well, Shane Mastin is the expert at that. He comes from the outside. And you see Motkins come over and pick him up. That is going to be a big factor today if they can avoid having that flash in front of Shade's face that linebacker coming in there and pressuring him. 20th catch of the year for McPherson. First and 10 frogs on the game's opening drive. And a fumble by Cedric Dickens still into the 32-yard line where Baylor recovers. That is Frankie Smith, the right corner. Well, he never got the handle on the football. You can see he tried to put it behind him. And as Dickens came around the corner, he just kind of scrambled for it. The ball just keeps on bouncing. And the lucky team comes up with it if you're a Baylor rooter. And Baylor now plus 10 for the year in the turnover category. They dodge a bullet. The TCU drive ends. And J.J. Joe... And the Baylor offense gets their first crack of the day, and it's David Mims, the tailback. Up the middle, Joe, the sophomore from Arlington Lamar, who was all-world until last week, only 7 of 19 for 70 yards and an interception against the Aggie defense. At one time this year, the nation's top-rated passer, he's still eight among the nation's quarterbacks and still leads the Southwest Conference. This is Henry's first carry of the day, and the replacement for straight, the sophomore from Lorena, will bring up third at about two or three. Brad Smith, the middle linebacker, on the tackle. The Baylor NCNB starting lineup. Henry, as we said, 187 compared to straight at 245 at fullback. Adam Arroyo, under the microscope today, he blocks the fine defensive end for TCU, Roosevelt Collins. After the plunge by Henry, it is third and three. Baylor, a good third down offense this year. And on the option, Henrik Bell, a true freshman who was just this week elevated to number two tailback, appears to have the first down. Anthony Hickman on the tackle. Let's look at the frog defense. Collins, we told you about, who Tap thinks may be the premier defensive end in the Southwest Conference this year. Senior from Shreveport. Reggie Anderson, the sophomore, leads the frog defense with 61 tackles. And in the secondary, Anthony Hickman, one of the better pass coverage specialists in the conference. First down, Baylor, there, 45-yard line. 
And Henry to midfield. Dave, that up front defense for TCU, I don't think knew that they weren't going to have to face straight today. No, I don't think they announced that until just before game time because he came out, I believe, dressed. Now, he may have gone back in and changed, but he did come out dressed. But everybody realized that he didn't practice this week, but it was kept very quiet. The reason I bring it up, you wonder if they let down because they were prepared for that big Harley up the middle and instead they get a Honda. And on the ground where Joe manages a recovery at the 47-yard line, one step ahead of Tunji Bolden. The Baylor Southwest Airlines team must. Well, Grant Tapp wants to turn his team loose and play hard-nosed football in every area. They've lost all their confidence in the kicking game. They're 0-4 on their last four field goal tries. And Robert's straight with that sore ankle. They hope that his replacement, John Henry, can pick it up. And he's got to do it to win. Those are today's Southwest Airlines team must. After the fumble, third down, eight needed. Five minutes gone in the opening period from Waco. We'll call it a long seven. And Joe with the short drop, incomplete. He tried to hit David Mim, circling out of the backfield against Tony Rand, and the Bears will have to kick it away. And that means Kent Brentham, fourth in the conference at nearly 40 yards per kick, and it also means Anthony Hickman, second in the conference at 13 yards per return. This TCU return game, punts and kickoffs, the best in the Southwest Conference. Outstanding nose-up spiral, which will go to the 12-yard line for the Hickman Fair catch. We'll see the Frog offense with 9.49 and a scoreless first quarter. Well, we're lucky we're not playing this game in flooded Fort Worth. We had some light showers a couple hours before kickoff today as we checked the Dr. Pepper scoreboard for the first time. And uh, now partly cloudy conditions. The breeze still very much a factor, and it's in the face of the TCU offense. They take over at their 13-yard line and send Kyle McPherson in motion. And on the draw play, Modkins tries the left side for about five yards. Modkins not big at all. 5'10", 190, about Trevor Cobb's size. Yeah, look what Trevor Cobb does with that same size. Modkins the same type of uh, same type of runner. I don't think he has the explosiveness that Cobb has once he gets through the hole, but Modkins runs under control and makes good cuts. They always want the mom and dad to send money. You notice that? Shade again with the audible, and again, nobody behind him. Four wideouts, all right. And under pressure overthrows Lewis, who is easy to overthrow at only 5'9". They get third and five. Shade at 6'5", 220. Is gonna, as Wacker is aware, see more than a few blitzes today, but if anybody is physically prepared to undergo that type of onslaught, it's Shade. Who's considered the only linebacker who outweighs him for Baylor is Happer. He's bigger than the other two. And he has changed the play at the line on just about every down. They almost run out of time on the play clock, and so they'll burn a timeout with nine minutes remaining in the first quarter. Shade's uncle, Jim Wacker, ready to decide a third and five strategy. Horn Frogs have made their decision on third and five from their own 18. And they send Monkins in motion. Virtually every play shade the freshman having to audibleize. And beat a blitz. Overthrown, intended for Stephen Shipley, and that is not easy to do. Shipley at 6-5. As is Shade, and the Bear defense getting a hand. Well, one of the things that Shade has got to recognize, as we said, is the blitz. Baylor, on the other hand, has to disguise the blitz, and they did a good job that time. 
He did not make the adjustment to that one back back there helping him, and Baylor blitzed and hurried the pass. Logs have changed punters recently. They've gone from true freshman Mitch Ashley to sophomore Trey Beacon. And it is Frankie Smith at the Baylor 44 waiting for the kick, which is not a good one. Blackwell trying to squeeze every inch out of the roll, and it will die at midfield after only 32 yards. This may surprise you. This is the third most played series in college football. Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Missouri, Kansas, the only two that have seen more than TCU and Baylor have met. It goes back to when TCU was in Waco. There's, there's your little known back of the day. At Rand College, where they moved up to Fort Worth. And here's your second little-known fact of the day. There have been 33 shutouts in this series. We don't look for that trend to continue today. On first and ten, Henry, a nice cut outside for about five. And Greg Evans and Tony Rand, the two frog safeties, combining for the tackle on Henry. Well, one of the things Henry did there, he, he ran into the back of a pile and then kind of slid off. Didn't just fall down, kept his feet and found a little seam to pick up that three or four yards. We've seen Henry go deep this year. He burned Rice for a 64-yard score, which looked at the time to be the touchdown that might turn that game in Baylor's favor. Didn't happen. Rice pulled the upset, and you know the rest. This was Henry again stuffed for maybe a half yard by Reggie Anderson. The TCU tackling leader, that weak side linebacker. Glad to have Prime Network with us again this week, and it's Nationwide Family, Regional Sports Cable Network. Baylor looking at third down and six. 7.38 in the first. Miles and Miller, both wide right. Bonner, who has been slowed a little by the defenses he's seen the last two weeks, is wide left. And a draw play to Mims. Had to cut back to have a chance at the first down, and he would appear to have it. That is nice vision by the junior from Dangerfield, and again, Anderson on the tackle. Absolutely a great choice in there. He ran into the hole. A linebacker came up and was going to make the tackle for a loss. Watch this. It's a little delay. It's a delay draw. Now he runs up in there. See the linebacker sliding right there. That's Brad Smith. Now he's got him, right? No. Watch Mim's adjustment. Back outside. And once he gets out inside, he uses that speed, makes a good cut underneath to come up with the first down. That's a great play. Mims looking better after only four carries with a bruised shoulder problem, limiting him a week ago. Henry limited to a couple. TCU physically should have a better than even shot at slowing down these, these thrusts up the middle. They have Lewis at 295, West the other tackle at 273, and Smith a big middle linebacker at near 250. And the first part of this option, Dave, that you've got to stop is stopped by those players that you mentioned, the inside people. The drop-off from Robert Strait's size to John Henry's, as you said, is 60 pounds. That's got to have an effect. Bell, the tailback, Mims getting a breather. And Pearson motion as Henry reaches the 34. Smith and Anderson combining for the stop. And again, a third down for Baylor. You know, this week, the when they practiced in scrimmage Tuesday and Wednesday, all the offensive linemen started wearing these diesel-powered yellow hats. And that's what they want to play football like, diesel-powered. Monty Jones came into Grant Taft's office the other day and had one of those hats on. You've got to have a slogan in college football today. Third and five, and Joe will keep for the first down to the 28-yard line. Another Reggie Anderson tackle. He's been in on virtually every stop on this Baylor series. The big John Turnpaw has a big influence on this front offensive line. He slimmed down to about 295. Look at the drive block. Just keeps those legs going and just collapses the defensive lineman in there. Baylor will use the timeout. Timeout, Baylor. Five minutes and 31 seconds to play in a nothing-nothing first quarter with Judge on hand, as always. Ladies and gentlemen, the Merrill Center. I think John Turnpaul might have gotten hurt on that play. He looks like he's coming limping to the sideline. 
A little bit on that left side, looks like. Well, you know, one thing that happens with AstroTurf or, or artificial surface is when you get a rain on it, it becomes very slippery. And they had that early rain just before a kickoff, and it's still on the field. What would you, as a player, rather face, a slippery AstroTurf or muddy grass? Well, I always like playing on grass. Grass gives, and you don't get hurt on it. You don't get those ankle injuries that you hear so much of and with the turf, artificial surface. But one thing that turf will do when you get really bad rain and that type of weather, it's a very, it's an equalizer in that it gives everybody good traction. You saw Joe's numbers in this game a year ago. This is the game that turned TCU season south. It was the game in which Leon Clay broke his hand. And like this year, they came in at 5-1, and one, but they didn't win a game after Clay's injury. Now, they have already won after Clay's broken leg this year. Big difference. They know they can do it. Bell and Henry in the eye. Henry going to be a weary man when this day is done. And again, the Frog middle three, Lewis, West, and Smith. We're ready for him. You mentioned Thomas Lewis in there. They, they list him at six foot, 295 pounds. But they say they list him at six foot. Jim Wacker said, we just try to make him feel good by listing him at six foot. He's probably 5'10", five, 5'11", <laughs> five, maybe. I'm betting three pairs of socks and cleats. <laughs> he is six foot. On the reverse, here comes Miles and Anderson ready for him again. When Miles took that handoff, it looked like a huge gainer, but Anderson read it perfectly. Well, Roosevelt Collins almost got his lights knocked out on that reverse. He's the upside, upfield containment on the play, and when they came around, one of those big offensive tackles just peeled off him. Anderson made a great recovery to stop it for a short game. 61 tackles for the year coming in, double figures for their first six games for Reggie Anderson. And what Baylor wanted to be a big gainer was not. It's third and a long four, and Joe under pressure. Complete, but no first down. It was Kendrick Bell out of the backfield. And the true freshman from Tyler will bring up a decision that Pat does not want to face very often today. No, he certainly doesn't. He sends in his field goal kicker, but one of the first things he said to us is we're 0 for 4, our last four attempts we've missed. This is one of those ones where you want to see your field code kicker kick it right straight through. You run out, shake hands, congratulate him, and off you go. But you always have to watch the fate. Watch Brenton. He was a high school quarterback. And at this spot on the field, they may go for a fake on fourth and three. This would be a 38-yarder. And Ireland ends the slump. Well, he nailed that thing. I mean, he nailed it. That ball, when it crossed the goal post, was as high as the goal post are. Two or three thousand pounds off that young man's shoulders, and three nothing Baylor. Well, some key third down pickups by the Baylor offense, and they get a 38-yard field goal from Jeff Ireland to take a 3-0 lead. Homecoming 1991 for the Bears starts off well, and Ireland will kick with, again, that strong breeze behind him to either Morey or Oliver. Or neither. And again, Frogs will go from their 20. What does that do psychologically for Jeff Ireland? Well, that's what I was saying. You want your field goal kicker to go out there. You want to see him drill it through, and he did. He didn't take a chip shot at it. As you said, he had a lot of pressure on him, but when he came to the sideline, everybody was high-fiving him, taking the pressure off. Look at him. They're still, they're still talking with him. Of course, three misses against Rice and a three-point loss. 0 for 1 in, in a kick that the Bears thought could well have been called good. They say it went right over the top of the upright last week. And those... Four misses following a 58-yard make against Rice. Well, 
Jay delivers to Shipley and a flag down as Clifford Ellison drags down Shipley at the 28-yard line. The flag in the TCU backfield that time for holding. That Baylor scoring drive. A lot of snaps for not many steps. Ten plays and 28 yards. Dave, in this situation on the field, the one thing Jim Wacker does not want to do is see his team make a mistake. Cough up the football, throw an interception, try to force it in. That's what he's told his team when they went off on the sideline when they came out. Or he said, don't make a mistake. At the conclusion of today's game, Dave and I announced the Southwest Airlines player of the game. Here's the officiating crew headed by Lloyd Dale this week. 347 and counting in the first quarter. It's going to be first and 23 for TCU, and they go safe to Modkins to the nine. Up for the tackle, Robin Big Cat Jones from left defensive end. That's probably as conservative as TCU is likely to get all day on offense. Well, that's surprising because uh, Jim Wacker's not known for his conservative play. Purdue continuing to lead Iowa second quarter. Modkin's got only two. Jade, not the fastest quarterback, but he can move, as you see, and he can avoid contact. That fumble well after he was down. Shade with the slide at the 22-yard line. Well, one thing that Shade does that really impresses me, although he's not a great runner, he sees pressure. He feels it. He's got great peripheral vision. Mastin looks like he's going to pick up. In the last second, he blitzes up there. This contact, and along with Jones on the outside, is going to flush him out of the pocket. And you see how he reacts to that pressure? He finds a nice little seam, picks up some good plus yardage. Credit to Benny Scott, the quick guard, for picking up that blitz by Mastin and giving Shade room to ramble and make it third and eight. Play change at the line again. And it will be Blacker behind Brian Hand, who finally drags him down at the 25. 52 for Blackwell. Well, Shade read this blitz well at the line of scrimmage. He made an adjustment, brought one of his outside wideouts, I think it was Motkins, back in to block for him, and then he just lays it up. There's Blackwell. He's just going to flat out feed him right off the line. He beats hands. One-on-one -on -one coverage, and what a well-thrown ball. Just lays it over the shoulder into Blackwell's hands. That's burning the blitz. And that's a tight end. Speed hands, and he is an underrated blocker. And the NFL can't wait to get their hands on him. First and 10, Baylor, 25-yard line. A minute 44 in the first quarter as the Frogs bit to the lead. Modkins hit hard by Keith Caldwell with a pickup of five yards. One of the players that we, we've highlighted a lot in our games with Baylor is Santana Dotson, number 77. He's trying to come down the line, and he literally gets blown off the ball. He gets picked up. That's called a scoop block. When the guard comes out on you, and then the tackle continues and picks you up. But what a football player Santana Dotson is. Shane on second and six. That is in traffic and out of bounds. But they say he made the interceptions before he went out of bounds, and it was Michael McFarland. Didn't think he got a foot down, but he did. And Shade pressured this time, threw the ball up. He threw before his receiver made the break on the ball. The defender, looking back, made a quicker break than his receiver. You don't want to pressure this ball. Try to force it into coverage. He throws off his back foot. You see the receiver, he's behind the defensive cover. Now watch the foot down right there. That's the good call. Intended for McPherson. And the sixth interception of the year for Shade. 
So Baylor, as close to their own goal line as you can possibly be. The nose of the ball, in fact, may be grazing the white paint on the all-pro artificial turf. With 58 seconds of the first quarter, Joe will try to burrow out what he can, a yard or maybe two. But what a sigh of relief for the Baylor defense. They were looking at maybe seven three down at the end of one. The one thing you don't want to do is try to force the ball, and Shade is going to learn that as he becomes more mature at that quarterback position. He's just a freshman. His coaches are on the sideline saying, you threw an errant pass. You should not have tried to force that ball in. But on the other hand, they don't want him to take the sack, so should he just throw it a little yeah. farther to the left out of bounds? Exactly. That's when you have to know when you just throw it away. Save the sack, save the interception, and keep possession. Joe, that's picture, and that's a safety for TCU. Nicholas Roosevelt Collins coming in from that side. Carnegie Bolden and Thomas Lewis converging on J.J. Joe. Well, you want to see what J.J. Joe is going to do. This is going to be a long pass. This is a fake option down the line. Now he's going to take the ball and step back. But you see the pressure there from the backside. That's 91 in there. That's Bolden. There comes Collins in there, and they sack him for a safety. Collins and Bolden, about as good a pair of defensive ends as you'll find anywhere. Yeah, they call them the bookends. You can see why. Look at the quarterback pressures from them. I'll tell you what, also, that was a good play by Joe not to fumble. You see how close he came oh, to bobbling yeah. that ball. Well, That's it's... a five-point save. His ability to hang on there. And it's 3-2 to two in the second inning at Floyd Casey <laughs> Stadium. All season, ups and downs on the Baylor roller coaster. They had an up on the McFarland interception, and now a down. But kind of an up because they didn't give up seven. So that's the season in microcosm. Baylor at five and two and two and two, hoping this will be the second year ever that two losses can get you to the Cotton Bowl. It happened to Houston at 84. And the Frogs at 5-1, and 2-1 one, and one in the conference. They're a point away from an undefeated start. That one-point loss to Arkansas still haunts them. Dave, the kick after the safety is back, from, of course, from the 20. But TCU should get great field position. If Baylor has one thing in their favor, they've got the wind at their back, and they have kicked off long. This is a beauty by Ireland, and it is Maury. The career TCU kickoff return leader to his own 46-yard line. A 36-yard return at Wacker once more. Toby Morey, 25 yards per kick return to lead the Southwest Conference this year. We have a holding on, on TCU, so that's going to negate that long return. Or that's not what you want to see if you're Jim Wacker. Let's see if we perhaps can see the hold. There's what I think they're calling the hold. Holding on the run back, first and ten. Tough to read the uh, the purple and white number there blocked off. But the mark off will have an irate whacker looking at first and ten from his 18-yard line with three seconds to go in the quarter. Well, look how far that penalty is. They had the ball almost at midfield. And now they're at their own 18-yard line. You're looking at about a 30 to 35-yard penalty. 28 yards is what they Gosh. lose. Now to the wishbone to the one back with Machin. Shea got away from Albert Fontenot and delivers short intended for Shipley as the first quarter comes to a close. Well, it's been a weird year. Why should today be any different? Three to two, Baylor at the end of one here in Waco. Back in Waco, Dave Farnett and Dave Rowe. 3-2 Baylor as we go to the second quarter. Second and 10 for TCU at their own 18-yard line. 
They took the island free kick after trapping J.J. Joe for the safety. Dickens in motion, shade over the middle. They Peterson first down to the 31-yard line. Ellison on the tackle. McPherson, third on the team, 19 catches coming in, and a couple this afternoon. Our first quarter number. Look this way. Baylor with only two passing yards. That's the number eight passer in the nation, held only two. And 110 to 47, but the TCU threat that ended in McFarland's interception, the reason they pray it. Modkins for no game. Maston came up in a hurry, as did Hafford. Weak and middle linebackers, respectively. Boy, Maston, 6'1", and, and they now list him at 205. That's up maybe 10 pounds from where they listed him when the year began. The best thing that they say he has is vision. He sees everything. Well, you wouldn't think he could play back there at 205. I mean, you're thinking defensive backs. The other defense went smaller and quicker to combat offenses just like this one from TCU. That is way over Shipley. Maybe he learned from the interception. Well, I think he did on that. That was well covered. He had a short and deep zone. He just threw it out of bounds. Well, what a specimen shade is. 6'5", 220. As a freshman, he'll have third and 11. He had a chance to play just about anywhere. He turned down Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, and Alabama to play for his uncle at TCU. You're going to see an interesting play on this ball. What they did is they came all the way around the outside. And what he does is he just tips the ball. See, he puts the ball back. Watch, he's going to reach out and just tip it. See right there, just puts the hand out and knocks the ball away. Matthew Pearson, I don't know if he touched that ball. He was there waving at it. I don't know if he got it. We do know Marcus Lowe on the recovery. But he, as you said earlier, he felt pressure. He knew it was there. I think that caused him to bobble the ball. Brett Pearson for forcing the second fraud turnover of the afternoon. And on the pitch, Mims. Close to another first down. They'll give him nine. Now, we'll, we'll check again. Does Shade fumble this on his own? Well, watch when he brings the ball back. You're right. He maybe, maybe didn't tip the ball. It looked as if he went around and tipped it. Maybe Shade with those wet hands just kind of just lost control of the football when he brought it back. It just looked as if it just spun out of his hand. That's a season-long trend for the Baylor defense. They came in at plus nine turnovers for the year. Henry through the front line and first and goal Baylor at the six-yard line. Tony Rand prevented a touchdown. When I looked at that Baylor line coming off the line that time, they were down. I mean, they were about a foot off the ground. They just drove. This is just straight drive blocking. They got behind Big Monty Jones in there and just blew off the ball. He found that little seam and then made it made the extra yard. It's a good tackle there by Rand to keep him from going in the end zone. Baylor up 3-2, looking for more. Henry, Anderson, and Smith closed along with Evans, the free safety. It'll be second and goal. Boy, Brad Smith is a big figure in the middle. 6'3", about 250. And watch him slide to the ball. Reads it well. Plays the block and misses the block and then comes underneath it and makes the tackle. That's what you want to do in a middle linebacker spot. Don't accept that block. Step up around it and make the tackle. He trails only Reggie Anderson and sees the tackles this year. Maybe a half yard gain. Second and five and a half. Goal to go. Last goal of the tight end went in motion. Joe's going to go the other way and keep. 
but not get in. Bolden showed his mobility running along with Hickman to keep J.J. Joe out of the end zone, and it's third and goal. And J.J. Joe on this place, this is just a naked reverse. He comes all the way out by himself. Now watch what he does at the tail end. He just kind of wants to just jump over, so he just jumps up into Hickman. Good hit by Hickman to knock him out of bounds. John Henry did not get in. What a first half. This has already been for Reggie Anderson, who met him face-to-face -face and has a word or two to cap it off, and it'll be fourth and goal. Well, defensive players play with emotion, and that's what Anderson is doing right now. He's being that emotional leader. He's number 44. Watch him just step up in there. Bam! Doesn't allow him to even fall forward. But they're going to go for it on fourth down. Joe, touchdown, Baylor. Did you see those big offensive linemen come over there and butt heads with J.J. Joe? Well, that's like a pat on the back that you just can't believe the emotion there. You come over, you butt heads. It's like saying, hey, you're one of us. So 9-2, to two, Baylor. Ireland on for the extra point. He is 22 of 23 for the year. There's by eight. Joe set this up by handing to Henry on the previous play, and that's what the TCU defense looked for again. Well, they had it stopped there to Henry, and Joe just makes a nice cut underneath. But that's all his play. When he reads that fullback, he's going to get tucked. He's going to get tackled. He pulls it out and goes in the end zone himself. There's Cash in another turnover. We're back after this from Southwest Airlines. Here's today's game tracer brought to you by the Schick Tracer. Bolden and Lewis shacked uh, J.J. Joe for a safety. But TCU has had the turnover bug bite hard today. Baylor with the Island field goal to end his 0 4 slump. And it's 10 2. With 11 41 in the first half. Baylor by 8 on the Joe keeper. Not as well as you can think. Up the middle on the option and Joe waltzing in to make it the Bears by 8. Ireland into the win, which has died considerably. Oliver, the true freshman from Dallas, Adamson. To the 28-29 yard line. And TCU has uh, shown their ability to move the ball, but not hang on to the ball today. Well, you know, Dave, every team has a headhunter. And this is Baylor's headhunter. Watch what happens to him. They know he's the headhunter. In other words, he's the one that comes down and usually breaks the wedge, makes the tackle. And he just kind of gets shoved out of the way. Look at him. See? Hey, that's a clip. That's Marburger pleading his case. Jay deep drop. Double pass. And a flag. It's intended for Modkins. And Tracy Miller argues, hey, fumble. See what Lloyd Dale called. He was uh, looking at Dodson sacking shade as he threw that flag. He's probably going to call it intentional grounding, but what it was going to be was that little underneath shuttle no pass. Foul, no foul, no foul. There was an eligible He didn't see Motkins at first, but he was there. Motkins was the one who kind of snuck up into the line, and then they were just going to, like, underhand shuffle pass it to him. Now watch. See, you want the pressure. Now you, what you do is just flip it underneath. There's Motkins, and he's getting destroyed in there. Shade. Already victimized by the interception and the fumble bug. Looks at second and ten. And that one thrown behind Michael Jackson. That's the Woodley spot again where Lewis started. Jackson has not caught a pass this year. Caught 42 two years ago. 
and then has been slowed ever since by leg injuries. And for the highest percentage passer in the conference, four for 12 says something about what Baylor's done to him. Because they put a lot of pressure on him. He needs to regroup, take that deep breath, and get his confidence back. Maston picked up on a blitz. Knocked away again. Baylor ball, Robin Jones. Finally cracking it down. But Dave, he may have had eight seconds to pass against Rice, but he has got to realize that you're not going to get that much time to stand back there and pick up wide receivers. And he just, this is his fault. He just, you can't come all the way around the outside and expect to make a sack. And that's exactly what Baylor did because Shade took too much time in there. Pearson runs right over top of the ball. He had a chance to pick it up. Jones caused and covered that fumble. Well, not, anytime an offensive lineman takes the defensive lineman all the way around the outside, you never expect a sack from that from that type of a rush. Baylor, first and ten, trying to add to an eight-point lead. Mims takes the pitch to the 15. And wherever the ball has been today, Reggie Anderson has been. He may have double-figure tackles by halftime. Well, he has really played that backer spot well. He's usually on the weak side, Anderson is, and he gets a free shot to run along that line. Now, the reason he's getting a free shot is because his up-front defensive line are, are playing very well. They're not given, driven off the football. Mims out, Bell in, and he takes it off right tackle. And fighting hard to try and get inside the 10-yard line. Hickman came up for the tackle along with Bolden. And it is first down, but not quite goal to go, Baylor. Well, that is just straight-out smash face football. That's just saying, we're coming at you, defensive line, here we come. Big man on big man there, just blowing off the line. And TCU is doing an excellent job at the point of attack where the ball is intended to go. McKenzie, the tight end, goes in motion as Henry goes to the eighth. He may have coughed it up. The Frogs say they have taken it back. I think, in fact, they do. You hear them all yelling, I've got it. Yeah, but you haven't seen an indication yet. Oh, yes, I have. I think Tunji Bolden got that one. It looked as if when he ran into the line, he started to back up on the run. Let's take a look and see if Mims doesn't, in fact, do that. No, it's Henry. Watch when he backs up, he loses it there. Roosevelt Collins with the hit to cause that fumble. The lights are on. It's very threatening weather in Central Texas. Well, the front that has poured down heavy rains on Fort Worth has reached Waco. When now shifting northerly. And here's what's happened after four TCU turnovers. Baylor punt, PCU safety, Baylor touchdown. Baylor coughs this one right back up. And from the nine-yard line, PCU still down by only eight. We have 10-11 to play in the first half. Modkins, Matthew Pearson will drop him for a loss at the five-yard line. And if, I'll tell you this, if Shade had any idea that he would pass, he can't pass now, Dave. There's got to be a 40-mile-an-hour wind right now coming straight in his face. Look at the camera shaking, taking the picture across the field. And we can't get our windows down. Ah, oh, homecoming, <laughs> just as I remember. Boy, this is serious wind. And incomplete. Intended for Lewis. Bring up a third and 14. Boy. I can't emphasize how the wind has changed. It was strong out of the south. It is right in the faces of the D.C. offense and us, by the way. Uh, from that vantage point, you see, out of the northeast. And we, we can see from where we are up here some rain northeast of us. It may uh, hit here in not too much more time. Okay. From the end zone, McPherson, but no first down. He's to the 13. 
And we'll see TCU have to kick into this gale. Of course, Dave, this really failure, uh, favors Baylor's running game in this situation. This punt, if they're smart, what you want to do in a punt situation like this is try to just get the ball as low as you can. Get it up, uh, just across the line of scrimmage and let's hope for a roll. That's what your team has to say in the huddle. Deacon needed a roll to get 32 yards out of his first effort. Well, that's low. The wind's going to catch it and take it out of bounds. And Baylor, which has averaged starting from their 47-yard line, will take over here at the Frog 44. And that's not a bad punt in this type of a situation with that wind in his face that hard. And now all of a sudden the wind seems to die down a little bit. Well, you're talking in relative terms. <laughs> yeah, it's died down to about 35 mile an hour. 50% chance of recurring thunderstorms was the forecast pre-kickoff. It rained about an hour and a half before kickoff, but not very hard, just enough to get the artificial turf good and slick. And now the Bears, first and 10 from the 44, will look to go deep to Potter. Joe can't find him, no time. Royal West from right tackle with the pressure along with Smith and Collins. Well, he only sent Bonner out on that play, and he had too deep coverage. That was one of the adjustments that TCU said they were going to make. They knew they couldn't cover Bonner with one man. And you'll see, Joe is looking at him. He can't find him. He can't find him. It's the only person out in this pattern, so he has to take the sack. Bonner, in his last 11 games, has caught nine balls for 45 or more yards, six of those for touchdowns. But Rice and A&M starting to figure out how to keep Bonner under wraps. Here's Mann. To the 35, no first down, but a pickup of about 12. It'll be third and one. You, know, you asked me earlier about running on AstroTurf as compared to running uh, in a wet surface, a wet grass. Well, let me tell you this. There's no way you could make those type of cuts in wet grass that Mims just made. Slashes through there, made two or three cuts, found a seam opening, and down the line, down the field, pick up about nine yards. Well, for Mims, a tailback on third and one. Henry, first down. And he keeps on going to the 32 of TCU. That's an awful lot of pressure to continue to put on your defense. With four turnovers and now the field position because of the short punt. Well, it certainly is, but their defense is holding up very well. I almost get the feeling that Jim Wacker was right and his players were right. Hey, all those other records and all those other traditions of losing late in the season, just judge us. Because his defense is playing very, very good football right now. Miles wide right, pitch to Bell. They really like this freshman. He got popped by Collins and still manages the game to the 25. You can absorb that lick, then you can play major college football. Roosevelt Collins goes 250, Kendrick Bell goes 160. Boy, it looked like a ping pong ball there for a second, bouncing off of one of those rubber bumpers because Collins just came down the line and bam, he hit him, spun him completely around. They give him seven, second and three. Joe on the pitch to Bell. Ed Gallabies came up from safety. And as usual, Anderson not far behind, along with Hickman. And Dave, if you could draw up how to play the option, that was the perfect play, way to play it. Play the fullback, stop him for no game. Joe came down the line, had to hold the ball, late pitch, and they stopped it for virtually no game. Back in is Mims. Bell game one third and two Baylor. Under six minutes, first half. They lead 10 2. In a turnover play, first half. Joe Pitch, Mims, first down, 17, but a flag is down. Oh, and I think they're going to call holding against Baylor. Side judge tosses that one as uh, Mims makes his final cut. I think it may have been on Stutzman. And as usual, 
You are correct. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you, uh, you, you have this sixth sense about you about penalties, which makes me figure you must have been flagged more than anybody on the field. I know what every you. penalty is. <laughs> I've heard this very often. <laughs> Holding against the offense. Perhaps we may be able to see Stutzman. He's number, I think he's 88 on the outside. Uh, 80, excuse me. And you may see the holding right there. That's what they're calling the holding. Just long enough to let Mims cut inside of Anthony Hickman. And cost the Bears a mark off back to the 30. And a first down, now third and eight. The wind at this point is diagonal from the far left corner of your screen to the near right corner. Go with time. First down, Reggie Miller to the 11. J.J. Joe had to throw that one across the wind, and he was perfectly on target. When he throws this out inside, outside pattern, the cornerback actually slips down, and you'll see the receiver wide open. Now he tries to make the recovery, and it's just too late. That was Steve Reed, the right corner. Only the third pass of the day by J.J. Joe. Henry inside the 10. Well, here's the uh, working conditions of our colleagues and cohorts bringing you today's televised football action. That is... Not where you want to be. <laughs> That's Cam on Cam. I'll bet he's really thankful we don't have the crane out here today. Because I wouldn't go up on it. I'm just guessing here. The temperature has probably dropped 20 degrees since the wind turned around out of the north. 423 in the first half. Seven needed on second down. Joe keeps pitches. Men's to the two. And it will be third and one for the first down and two for the touchdown. Evans on the tackle. I always marvel every time I watch J.J. Joe run this option because it reminds me so much of the great option quarterbacks, the Quinn Groby, that had that ability to read down the line whether that fullback is going to be tackled, pull the ball out, then run down the line, read the backer, and make the correct choice, whether to pitch it or whether to turn it up. And he is doing a masterful job on the option. McKenzie in motion, Henry diving for the touchdown. Touchdown of the year by John Henry to make it 16-2 Baylor. The only official who didn't hesitate that time to throw up both hands, the line judge. And on for the extra point, Ireland. And he stood at 17-2. The officials on the middle <laughs> part of the field couldn't decide here. Well, they saw such a big pile. One of the things you can't do is expect to get underneath those defensive linemen and Henry just launches himself. Now, if you're a linebacker, what you have to do is you have to come in there and grab him. You just don't go underneath and let him fall over top of you. The backer was in great position to make it, but just didn't come up with a stop. 3.32 and a half. We're back after this from Southwest Airlines. Under very, very leaden skies in Waco. Now 17-2 Baylor. After the touchdown dive by John Henry with 3.32 in the first half. Now if Ireland, uh, who will probably have to have Frankie Smith hold the ball on the tee here, the nine play drive covered 44 yards. If Ireland can get this one up in the breeze, it may go 900 yards. Well, I see a whole group of kids standing in the end zone in about the first five or six rows, they all got their hands up. They may be trying to catch it. And here it comes. 
Toby Mori for the fair catch. What a frustrating first half for TCU offensively. They know they can move the ball. They've done it, but they just haven't held on to the ball. Well, one of the things they have to do right now is kind of regroup. They need to get in there, and they need to get some first downs. They need to get some type of a score before halftime and try to go in on a positive note. Shade has fumbled twice and thrown an interception. Dickens also with a fumble. So four TCU turnovers. You can credit their defense for the fact that they are only down by 15. They came up with the safety and followed one giveaway with a quick takeaway. Watkins on the draw play and not much. Teddy Patton closed on him in a hurry. Almost a forgotten man of the Baylor front four, the senior from Cisco. You hear so much about Dotson, Lowe, and Jones that you forget Patton's not a bad player. Certainly is not. If he doesn't make that tackle on that play, Motkins is going to run for 20 yards up the middle. And he might have gotten two. Second and eight. 306 and counting. Second quarter. Frogs lose. They are probably out of the Cotton Bowl race. Blackwell. And drags him down. He has a first down. Kelly Blackwell's third catch. He's got 75 receiving yards. 52 of those came on one grab. Well, one of the things that Blackwell does so well is he does not fumble after he catches the football. He puts it away. Grant Taft, maybe his biggest fan. He says he is the best tight end in America. Modkins. Still looking for the hole, and it closes courtesy Albert Fontenot and Marcus Lowe in the left defensive front. And play selection in this situation, Dave. TCU has got to think pass. The runs, Baylor will let them have the runs all day long and hope that they get three, four yards. The clock just keeps on ticking. But you've got to move the ball downfield via the pass to score with only two minutes left. Bob DeBess, offensive coordinator for TCU. Second and nine. Everybody coming to Baylor, and down goes Shade and a marker. Dotson the first to bury Tim Shade, but we'll see what the penalty indication is. Well, from this position, it looked like a wave of green just going over top. If that's holding, that... <laughs> That holding did the least amount of good of any holding penalty ever. Actually, what it is is tripping. Couldn't tripping see, on the offense. You, you couldn't see Lloyd Dale's foot making that, that indication. So we'll back out and see it again. Yeah, tripping by the offense, the crime. Third. So how hard would Shade have gone down without the trip? Well, what a trip is, is usually a leg whip, sticking that leg out. And trip. Yeah, see it right there on the left of your screen? That's the trip. You stuck that left leg out. A lot of times you call that leg whipping, but that's just tripping. That's great camera work. It was John Marsh, the strong side guard. And it's third and 16, and they're coming again. Robin Jones. Dragging down Shade at the 30, and the Baylor offense will get it back. Well, again, this is a secondary sack because there's just no one for Shade to go to. There's no way you can ask your offensive line to give you any more time than this to find your wide receiver. They were all covered. Shade had no choice except to pull it down and run. So, Trey Beacon will again have to contend with this win, and with a minute 27 and a half, Baylor will get a chance to add to the 17-2 lead. What we have coming for you at halftime, as always, we will test your knowledge of the Southwest Conference with the Southwest Airlines Trivia Tester. We feature TCU defensive end artist Roosevelt Collins, and we will meet this week's classroom champion. All this plus first half highlights coming up at halftime. Bunch of camera shy individuals. That's those defensive linemen. They love to get on there. Dotson, Lowe, Patton, and Jones.
Any chance they could do away with that mascot for? <laughs> uh, he, not an Indian. He's cute. <laughs> 17-2, fourth and 14 for Beacon. Lee Miles usually returns punts for Baylor, but today it's Frankie Smith. And this one end over end, we'll get a big PCU hop. Smith touched it, so he's got to field it back to the 18 he goes. And a flag. And Smith retreated after a 50-yard kick and roll by Trey Beacon. Well, now if the play, if the penalty is against the receiving team, which it almost always is in this situation, you've got a minute and 19 seconds. You've got two timeouts, plenty of time to stop the ball and perhaps get your best field position in a long time. That's the sign of clip. This should take him back to about the 10-yard line. And and this should really button down what Tap has in mind offensively. With this little time, he you would think would settle for the 15-point lead and avoid disaster that close to his own goal line. Sure. This is where you're going to call that offensive line. You're going to say, hey, listen, we're not doing any fancy any fancy thing. We're just going to blow it out of here. Taking on the run back, first and 10. Frankie Smith, I don't think, wanted to touch it, but he did, so he knew at that point, right there, he has got to cleanly field it with Philip Holler barreling down on it. Mims and Lewis are the backfield, and Mims looks for room and finds none. Kanji Bolden with the tackle, timeout TCU, 108 and a half. Frogs with their second timeout. Baylor has one remaining. Southwest Conference featuring the surprising Arkansas Razorbacks at the top at 4-0. A&M 2-0 and then TCU and Baylor at the three and four texas still mathematically in at one and one at the cotton bowl against smu this afternoon could have won a lot of money if you told somebody arkansas would be four and oh especially after last year's finished i think they they finished eighth last year and really were never in contention Baylor at Arkansas next week. And the Bears in the surprising position of being spoilers the rest of the way. Look at this experience combined. Half and Wacker, the two most experienced Southwest Conference head coaches, 302 wins. The other seven combined for barely one-third that total. Yeah, they probably call them rookies. All the other coaches combined. Half in his 20th year at Baylor. Wacker's 21st year of college coaching, his ninth at TCU. They are the Greybeards in this conference. 108 in the half. As it is Henry to the 10, and the Frogs, you would think would, and they do, burn that final timeout. And that comes with 58 seconds. Jim Wacker, as usual this week, is the bundle of enthusiasm and optimism. Every year, they hit November, and they have Texas, and they have Houston, and they have A&M, and they traditionally, if they have a contender to this point, drop out of the race. We talked with him yesterday, and he seems convinced that this team is going to be totally unaffected by history. Well, that's what he said. He said this team has got a pride about it. And his players are not reacting, looking at that, saying, oh, boy, here we go into November again. They're saying, hey, judge us. Just judge us by what our record is. We're going to play hard football. And to lose as many players, and especially at key spots, quarterback, you lose your first-team quarterback, you lose your second-team quarterback, not many teams can recover from that and play as competitive as TCU has with their third team quarterback which was shade at the beginning of the year and Vogler the second teamer is available he is uh, the guy who was cooking in the department a few weeks ago 
and uh, had some grease splatter on his left hand and had second degree burns but available for duty today third and 11. on the draw Mims cannot get away from thomas lewis and with 50 and counting, TCU hoping for one last crack with their out-of-timeouts, and TCU will, or Baylor will be in no hurry to kick this one away. Well, if you're Baylor, you may even take the penalty, take the delay of game, because it'll wipe 25 seconds off the clock. I know Grant Taft thought right away, well, perhaps we should take the safety in this position, but that would only put him up by, 14, by 13 points, so he can't afford to take that safety. He almost has to punt it. So Brentham will be five yards deep. Anthony Hickman is at midfield. And here they come, and they almost got it. I don't know how they missed it. Hickman to the 33 with three seconds. Brentham did a magnificent job getting off a 35-yarder. I think there's a flag on the play all the way across the field as we wait for that but i think what happened is he went underneath it he didn't come up above where the ball was going to be kicked rempham you saw very upset that roughing wasn't called in the last two weeks we've seen lloyd dale very reluctant to call roughing there was a instance with pete rayford of arkansas last week where he was touched and they will call personal foul baylor on the return by hickman but Dale last week didn't call roughing even though Rayther went down. He didn't think it was enough contact, and he says the same here. Good. Well, maybe we can see this almost block. Watch the, as they come around to block it. Now, the ball's way high. Now, watch, I think he goes underneath it. We saw him flash in front. Off the post. Unsportsmanlike conduct. After the play was over. The first and ten. Now, the ball was Davis. The ball was going to be on the 33-yard line. They're marching it down. This could be a this could be a key play because they can get a field goal try. They were going to be out of field goal position when they when with this play because of the wind. Now they're inside the 20 yard line. The guy that almost got the block was Angel Alvarez, and as you said, he went right under the punt. They'll have a chance from 36 yards out. Jeff Wilkinson is 7 of 11 this year, along a 47 yards in his career. And he lines it up, and no good. Jim Wacker almost got a free three points at the end of the first half, but the win strong. Right to left, blowing that one wide left, and Baylor up 15. Boy, instead of going in the locker room on an emotional high that you just scored and got back in the football game, they go in with that emotional just just dying. DCU victimized by four first-half turnovers, and it is Baylor 17-2 at halftime at Floyd Casey Stadium in Waco. Here at Stormy Waco, Texas, Baylor leads 17 to 2 over TCU at half. Now let's go down to the field and be entertained by the show window of TCU. We'll be back with more of our halftime show right after these messages. Baylor leads TCU at halftime 17 to 2. Roosevelt Collins is not only one of TCU's best players on the field, he's also a very talented artist and poet. And Tony Martinez, producer of the Jim Wacker TV show, recently spent time with the Frogs defensive end. Midway through his senior season, Roosevelt Collins has been the Horn Frogs' most valuable player. For two successive weeks, he was Southwest Conference Defensive Player of the Week. 
Longtime Frog followers can't remember the last time a TCU defender has done that. Collins, though, seems to be taking all the praise in his very large stride. As far as personal goals, I don't really have any personal goals right now. I'm just trying to take it a step at a time, a day at a time, do the best I can do. You know, uh, it's the only as good as your last ball game. So I'm just trying to continue to get better as the season goes along. Collins, the graphic design major, realizes that some find it hard to accept this tough defensive lineman who's also a talented artist. Along the way, he's had to endure the jokes. Just to walk across campus with a tackle box in my hand, not really a tackle box, but an art bin, and Leon Clay used to think I'm telling me I was going fishing every day, he me going across campus. I told him I'm going to class, they think I'll be going fishing somewhere. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, those new classes, you know, uh, uh, I think the whole team's envious of him. Uh, but like Coach Wacker said, I wanted to take the class, but you know, I thought I might catch a cold, so <laughs> that's that. <laughs> So this shy kid from Shreveport understands the attention he gets comes with a job, but he'd rather sit off by himself, sketching or reciting the poetry he writes himself. Can you stand the pain of your life for a kid that says the downs and distance? My sight doesn't see the hundred yards, and when it does, my world of chance becomes blurred by rays that only the strongest heart can understand. Sometimes I cry because I try so hard to be better than you, but never giving in to the pain and the sorrow. It is the pain and sorrow which drives me to the point of understanding. I understand that the pain and sorrow which turns inside me is that which drives me. A wise man once said, he who tries with all he has given of his heart and soul will one day come to understand the meaning of life. My life a chance is to understand is to never give up. I was given myself heart, body, and soul just for one moment in time. To understand the meaning of winning, you, my friend, must go through the pain. My body pains for the day when I'm victorious. The students here at Baylor are just so eager and willing to learn. You get a lot of personal attention in class, and that's what I think really makes the difference. Most of your classes, you only have about 20, 25 students. The professors go out of their way to get to know the students, even in large classes. And the campus is very compact, so all your classes are close together. The question is, is if you want to be one in 60,000 in a large college, or if you want to come to Baylor and be more than just a number. continues in Waco. 17 to 2 Baylor over the Horn Frogs. As we prepare to start the second half, not only is it raining, the wind has not died down uh, noticeably at all and it continues very strong out of the northeast. And if you didn't come prepared today, then it's a real test of just how hardy a football fan you are. But I tell you not many if any have left at halftime. That's a credit to Baylor's homecoming crowd which they thought might be 40,000 and probably because of the conditions won't quite hit that total today. Ray Beacon with the wind behind him. Will kick to Miles and Miller. It's Miller and it's a Baylor touchback. The one good bit of news from the Weather Bureau is there has been hail nearby, but they don't expect us to be hit by any hail. Rain probably throughout the second half, however, and if we pointed out the first half, that favors the ground-oriented bears. It's hold on time right now. When they came out of that locker room, they saw this heavy rain. I'm sure the first thing the offensive coaches said is don't fumble the football. Make sure you tuck it away. Keep good control of it. In the first half, you see the drive chart, first half possessions for the Bears. And you really got a graphic indication of their field position advantage. They may cough that up here. Scramble at the 11. Dave, I thought that was a lateral. I think that was definitely a lateral for Mims. And Baylor on the bottom of that pile. But they lose nine yards. But watch as Joe goes down the line here. He's just going to flip it over there, but it's behind him. Again, a wet ball. They're changing it all the time, but that ball gets wet in a hurry. TCU should have come up with that football. 
now. Somebody from Baylor just got in there and kind of pulled it out. And Mims, after having that pitch go off his shoulder pad, turned his attention away from the tackler who was bearing down on him, and he is very slow getting up. Mims already uh, with a bruised shoulder before this game. He bruised it against the Aggies last week. And we think Craig Bellamy, the right tackle, recovering that men's fumble, and they mark the uh, ball at the 12, so a loss of 8, second and 18. And so close for TCU. If they cover that fumble, how quickly this game could turn around. New tailback Greg White on his first carry of the day. He's a junior from Waco. He has averaged almost six yards per carry this year. And Reggie Anderson makes the tackle. These are the current weather conditions. Temperatures, we said, has really dropped. It's 70, and it feels cooler because of that 20-mile-an-hour northerly breeze. And the rain has been very steady since early in the halftime show by the TCU band. I can tell you it changes the entire complexion of this football game. You have to be so much more aware of a slippery football. The AstroTurf holds water rather than draining it off. It holds water. You don't soak it in. So there's going to be a lot of water on the football field. Henry the lone setback on third and nine. And Joe retreats and hits his tight end, Alonzo Pierce. He will have a first down and a lot more. Knocked out of bounds finally by Tony Rand, but what a big punch. The Baylor offense throws 34 yards on third and long. Well, what happened is TCU guessed that time and they blitzed. And they Baylor had the perfect call on a blitz. It's a slip screen out to what is Joe JJ Joe's left right here. See the pressure, the blitz, no one out here. He picks up great blocks there by his big offensive lineman. That's Turn Paul and Jones coming out there. And Pierce, who many people think is one of the most underrated players here, picks up big yardage. Wacker and defensive coordinator Mike Dove go for the jugular with the blitz, and it is burned. Henry right through that front wall, and he'll have nearly 10. The backup strong side linebacker Mike Moulton, a very promising retreat freshman from Arlington, St. Houston on the tackle of John Henry. Let's review what we said at the outset Baylor had to do. Well, first of all, they had to come out and sick them, and they have done that. Reestablish the kicking game. They've been perfect on that. Straight to Henry with no drop-off. Henry had 15 carries, 45 yards. That's not Robert Strait's statistics, but it's still a good job. Henry has the first down. 34-yard line. Again, Moulton on the tackle. Dave, one of the things you see as you look at Henry come back to the huddle is he wears a visor. Now that is hard in the rain because the rain has a tendency, just like a windshield, to get on the visor. If you turn around, we can see it, but it's hard to catch a pass when you're looking through a, a cloudied up uh, visor. As our producer, David Handler, points out, pretty soon somebody's going to invent little wipers. They'll take care of that problem. Well, the difference being on the run is they place it right in your belly, and you don't have to look it in. You just take it in. First and ten bears. David Mims is back in, so he shakes off the injury on the first play of this half, and Brad Smith brings him down at the 33. The TCU first half must. Well, they had to burn the blitz, and they did that one time with Blackwell. They did a good job on it. Control the line. They really have not controlled this good old Baylor line. And allow nickels and dimes, that's, what they, that's what's kept them in this football game, is that they have not allowed the big play by Baylor, the long scoring to Bonner pass, say. All Baylor has needed to do is nickel and dime with the field position they've had. The one big play was a 34-yarder they just threw to Pierce. Joe with Bolden bearing down on him under throws. The intended receiver at the 30, the tight end Pierce. And it'll be third and nine. Well, that was a good play by Bolden to keep that backside containment. Baylor has elected to go with that naked reverse where he fakes it onside and he just comes to the backside free, hoping that TCU would react 
and he'd get out there by himself, but Bolden has reacted very well on that play both times they've tried to run it against him. Joe looking deep, settles for the completion for the first down at the 23, and that is Reggie Miller's second big catch of the day. He came in with only nine for the year. An excellent pass by J.J. Joe that time, really not stepping forward, all arm strength, and he threw it right in the seam. There was a hand that came from one of the defensive backs that almost got in there, but just was short. Just a superb pass by J.J. Joe. Iowa by one now over Purdue. On the pitch, White got away from the middle linebacker, Smith, and then Evans knocked him out, but Greg White picking up an additional six or seven yards after breaking that tackle. We were talking about Miller. He's the only wideout for Baylor with a catch today. He's got two for 29. They have shut out Melvin Bond. Earlier this year, that didn't look possible. Well, the one way they've shut out Melvin Bonner is to do double coverage on him. They're a two-deep zone, and they are putting two people all the time on Melvin Bonner. That's how much respect he commands. First man through is Henry for maybe one. Now, that may be a good example of the big difference, and there's nothing that Henry can do anything about. When straight carries and they're ready for him, the pile still moves three or four yards. Yeah, he takes the pile right along with him, and you watch him as he rumbles through there. And he's got two or three people, and you just don't get a Robert straight down until you hit him low. The difference is 60 pounds. However, this guy averages 6.3 per carry. And that's actually better by more than a yard per carry than straight. That says something about what, what Fred Goldsmith was talking about two weeks ago. He'd rather face straight at less than 100% than Henry full bore. On third and five, Baylor with some confusion will call time with 10.59 remaining in the third quarter as the rain continues unabated in Waco, 17-2, Baylor. This has been an unusually dry autumn, so uh, all things considered, we're going to be glad to have the rain. 159 in the third, and after the timeout, Joe, on the option, will keep and get belted at the 17-yard line by backup middle linebacker Patrick Collin uh, Connolly, Jr. from Duncanville, former walk-on who earned his scholarship last spring, and it will be fourth and five for Baylor, and on comes Ireland. Boy, and if you ever want to run a fake field goal, this is the perfect time to run it. When you've got a lot of rain, you've got slippery conditions, you kind of catch the defense off guard, and if you don't make it, you still got the offense way, way back in their own territory. That 38-yarder into the 0 for 4 slump. Searching over two weeks for Ireland. This one was placed down, or will be, at the 25, and it is a 35-yarder which is oh. good. That's as oh. low as you can pick it and sneak it in. And Ireland says, hey, I'm due one. That looked like Phil Necro throwing the <laughs> knuckle ball through there. The ball did not have any spin on it. Came right off his foot. I think it might have got through some hands going across the line. But watch the ball as it comes through. No spin. You see the white on the outside? Boy, now when you're lucky, and you can see the reaction here. He's going... Oh, boy, if that one makes it, I can make anything. Better to be lucky than good. He'll take it. 20-2, Baylor. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is the Raycom Network. This is Channel 8, WFAA-TV, Dallas, Fort Worth. From Floyd Casey Stadium in Waco, Texas, Dave Barnett and Dave Rowe. Baylor's lead up to 18 on Jeff Ireland's second field goal of the afternoon. And I said earlier, not many folks had left. I would like to amend that statement. Floyd Casey Stadium starting to hemorrhage fans. With five minutes gone in the second half. On one hot morning. 
And they will grab him at the 22, 18 on the return. Ray Matthews with the arm tackle to bring down Moore. This is our headhunter again. Got popped off the line, but still gets down and recovers and gets in on the tackle. That's why they call him the headhunter. He just kind of searches it out. Lance Marburger. Watson bearing down on Shane, all alone, Blackwell, his second big gainer of the afternoon to the 43. 41 yards for Blackwell. You know, when you think of a wide receiver, Dave, you think of speed, race, moves, and things like that. Blackwell has that, has that also, but he is a super strong football player. He's got great upper body strength. Four catches today. He is near the century mark, 96 yards. Led all collegiate tight ends last year. Nearly six catches per game. Better numbers than that this year. Motkins. Stop and go move. Got away from Ellison. And finally, the saving tackle by Keith Caldwell. For a minute, that had six written on it. Caldwell holds him to a gain of 14. Remember what I said about Kelly Blackwell with that great strength? Who do you think throws the key block from the tight end spot? Watch 86 get in there and throw the key block right there. To open up the hole for Modkins. Took Hafford out of the picture. Any big gain in this stadium feels good for Modkins from nearby Marlin. First and 10. There, 43. Maston on a blitz, forces Shea to overthrow Shipley. Ferris Walker had good coverage on Stephen Shipley. Well, the first half drive chart for TCU, a much different picture than the Baylor chart we showed you before. Four turnovers. And they had the opportunity late in the half, couldn't connect on the wind-blown field goal. You can see by the arrows where their possession started, all deep in their own territory. Watkins out, Cedric Dickens in motion out of the backfield. Shade again under pressure, got it off, well behind Dickens. And now a scramble at the 45 between John Marsh of TCU and uh, Santana Dotson of Baylor. And we're going to see a new quarterback for the first time today and for the first time in a few weeks for Matt Vogler. As we said, he burned his hand in that cooking accident at his apartment a couple of weeks ago. Shade shook up on the previous play, and so Vogler, who was listed as available, but they didn't want to have to use him today. The senior from Tampa, it really hurts that left hand when he takes the snap. Handles this one okay, and on the money to Stephen Shipley, but I don't think he ran the pattern deep enough to get the first down. I think he's about a half yard shot. Well, knowing the gambler that Jim Wacker is, they'll probably go for it, but a lot of times you bring in a new quarterback and you get a big spark. Shipley just does a curl underneath. It's just an angle. You run deep, come underneath. Now he has first down yardage there, but he just kind of falls down just about a, maybe about a foot short. Well, this is an easy decision to go for it. The, the tough part is what type play, and if they're close enough that you think a, a leap by Motkins should get the job done. Probably wouldn't want Vogler to have to handle it with as much tape as he has on the left hand. But well, one of the things you do in this situation is you ask for a measurement. That gives you a little bit more time to make that consideration as to what you will do. Oklahoma stung a couple of times, first by Texas. A couple of feet. I'm Matt Vogler. What I'm going to come is I'm going to come up that line. I'm going to tell my team, 
Listen for the snap count. See if you can perhaps draw them off sides and get that free first down. If you don't, have a solid play run behind what you consider to be one of your best linemen. You got Bree Love, the center at 275. Scott and Marsh average 300 pounds at guard. And they go to Dickens, and he might have it. The spot will be everything. Cedric Dickens, the junior from Quanta, with that forward lean, might have just barely edged past the first down marker. Boy, what a pile Brian Hand and Clifford Ellison made at, at the point where the ball was going to go. They came down, took down the interference, and if Dickens made it, it's just because he dove over top of it. I think he's going to be short. And we're back after this from Southwest Airlines. Dave, I think if Dickens had made a better choice on this play and cut the ball up underneath, he might have picked up this first down. At the point of attack, they get knocked down. Now, right, look right to his right. You see the hole open up. He only had to make one yard. He continues out and stumbles over his own man and comes up short. <laughs> So credit the Baylor line for giving Joe and company a new possession. Bradford Lewis this week, the second team fullback behind John Henry and Thomas Lewis. No relation, made the tackle. Only seven passes by Baylor. He said when you have the things happen that we've had the last two weeks, you go back to what you're all about. He says, our personality is based on grinding it out. And that's what they're doing this afternoon. Lewis coughed it up after the tackle at the 40. They will need about four on third down. Right to have Prime Network with us again this week and his nationwide family of regional sports cable networks. And what Tap was talking about goes for his defense, too. His defense, in his own words, very soft, near its own goal line. The last couple of weeks, he thinks playing so many run-and-shoot type offenses has taken some of their run defense edge away that they had built up, for instance, against Colorado when they were magnificent in short yardage situations. The first thing he said to me was, we were lucky because we were able to practice hard, scrimmage hard, and we didn't have anybody injured. Joe with a quick timeout call, and that leaves Baylor with only one more. But things pretty well in hand, midway third quarter, 7.24 to go, and an 18-point lead. This is where a coach earns his money, would you say, when you have uh, the experience that they've had. You can't fall farther than Baylor the last two weeks. No, they were rolling along here and there. They're thinking of undefeated seasons and things like that, and all of a sudden the bottom kind of fell out on them. But they're trying to get it back together. Next week we're in Austin. And the Texas Tech Red Raiders will challenge the Longhorns, who will hope to be still in the running for the Cotton Bowl when that game comes along. They've got SMU this afternoon in Dallas. Hope you can join us from Memorial Stadium next Saturday for the Red Raiders and the Longhorns. This one is 20-2 Baylor at TCU, not only facing the elements, but also a pin shade over on the sideline trying to loosen up his right shoulder. They're not working on him. The trainers aren't attending to him, but you have to wonder whether this is now in Vogler's hands the rest of the well, day. I think it is because he came in and completed that first pass and it really gave him a good start. You know, if you look at this score, you think that they're out of the football game, but when you look at that two-point conversion, you get two of those and two touchdowns, and you're back in the football game. Joe will look deep, knocked away. 
And the still Baylor ball on what was ruled an incomplete pass and not a fumble. Roosevelt Collins bearing down on Joe. Bottom of that pile is the tight end, McKenzie. And this is that same play as they've been so successful with here at Baylor, and that is to come down the line, fake the option, then drop back and throw the long pass. But look at the pressure from the backside by Collins. They're just not giving them a lot of time to complete passes. And the ruling was Joe's arm was forward. On that replay, it looked questionable. And it's Bolden who comes up limping. They had a pretty good angle on that... Uh, on that attempted pass by Joe. Very borderline. But they rule it incomplete, and we see Brentham. Hickman at his 18-yard line. The win now pretty much a cross win. Far side to near side. Virtually no return for Anthony Hickman. Steve Stutzman down for a quick special teams hit. Punt traveled 33 yards, and the Broads go from the 26. Don't forget at the conclusion of today's game, Dave and I announced the Southwest Airlines player of the game. Stay with us and keep that in mind. As we go to 7.07 in the third period, and Vogler remains the quarterback. Play action, Maston on a blitz, picked up well. Blackwell, another catch. Caldwell drives him out of bounds with a first down at the 40. Oh, when Blackwell comes off the line, he gets open in a hurry. He just loses his defensive coverage. Every time they've gone to him, he's had no one around him once he makes the catch. The sporting news, very high on the, some individual units in the Southwest Conference. They named the Aggie secondary best in the nation, the Texas defensive line best in the nation, and the TCU receivers best in the nation. We are not viewing one of those receivers today. That's going to be pass interference as it's over McPherson's head. McFarland had the cover. The guy the Frogs are missing today is Richard Woodley, who could uh, have a big impact on a game like this. Little swing passes out of the backfield, his forte. It is offensive interference. That's a surprise because I didn't I didn't see it on that play. I thought it was defensive interference. And then all of a sudden I see another flag come flying out. I think somebody said something. It might have been Motkin said something that the official took offense at. That it is, unsportsmanlike conduct. Now watch Shipley. You may be able to see that Shipley hits him in the face. Let's see, let's see what our picture shows. Right there, he pushes him off. Maybe that's what they called. Maybe that's the defensive. There's the flag coming in. That is evidently the interference. But we couldn't see when the ball went airborne. Shipley but looks like he was just coming off the line, it, just trying to get free. It did, didn't it? On, it's hard to read because you don't see the ball, but it looked like the ball might not have been thrown when Shipley had that contact. Wacker right. having a word with Shipley. Well, I think it's as confusing to Jim Wacker because you know how how outgoing he is when he thinks a call goes against him. I think he's a little bit confused on the, as to what the call was also. Then you tack on the dead ball foul on sportsmanlike conduct. You're talking about a long walk back. And I think Lloyd Dale's microphone, a casualty of the conditions. So we didn't hear him make the call, but you know what it is already. And the Frogs march all the way back to their 13-yard line for second and 37. That's a 27-yard penalty, the combination of the two. Got to get to midfield. Quick dump, there's Blackwell out of one tackle. Finally, Ellison and Caldwell dragging down at the 23. That's a quick pin. And now third and a mere 27. Blackwell having a big day. 
That's his sixth catch. He's got 121 yards. Now if they could get Shipley involved, he's been pretty well controlled. Only one grab for nine. That's what they need to do now. They need to come downfield, throw that deep pattern to Shipley, and hope that at worst they get an interference or a catch. Lewis, who replaced Woodley, held without a catch so far. Blackwell again. Hafford knocks the ball free, but out of bounds. And they mark Blackwell out at the 39. Fourth and 11. Well, I talked earlier about how open Shipley gets. Number 86. I mean, Blackwell, Blackwell gets. He just kind of spins around. Now he's got the ball. Comes up field. Now the ball gets raked out from the back but it goes out of bounds before the recovery. That may be the first real mistake we've seen uh, him make today, the way he was carrying that ball so loosely. He can to kick to Smith. And again, the wind more diagonal than straight across the field. And Smith really fighting for every yard he can stretch out of that return, and he gets 12. That's a net kick of only 23. As the rain continues in Waco, Baylor by 18. Well, if that's a TCU fan, he does not like what he sees. 22, Baylor with 5.49 to play in the third. White remains the tailback. And Joe, on the roll, will fire just off the hands of Lee Miles. Baylor relying almost exclusively on their ground game today. Joe, 4 of 8, 65 yards through the air. You would think with a 20 to 2 lead that that's exactly what Grant Taft would really like to see happen. Aggies, Aggies are just an incredible first half team. We talked last week about the teams that have had trouble in the first half. Arkansas and Texas to name two. A&M is unbeatable until halftime. Pretty unbeatable after halftime. White to the 40. Bring up third and eight for the Bears and uh, some raw feelings. Greg Evans, number six. Made a brief charge uh, toward the Baylor huddle, and Anderson roped him back in. Speaking of the Aggies, they lead Houston 11-1 with two ties at Kyle Field, where they're playing today. And that's not too far from where we are, 90 miles or so, so weather conditions may be a factor in that one against Houston and for the ground-oriented a and attack. Joe, complete to Reggie Miller. First down, Frog 47, big day for Miller. I want to tell you what a surprise that is to me, to throw the football when you have a lead, but they have so much confidence in the combination of J.J. Joe and Reggie Miller. Miller comes off the line. He's just going to run a simple curl pattern. Just pull up. His defender's too far back. He, Joe just delivers a perfect strike. Miller, the man that TCU has decided to leave open as they double botter and continue to hold him without a grab. First down, conservatism to Henry. Patrick Connolly. Smith's back up at middle linebacker, first man to greet Henry. If there was ever a guy who was named to be a fullback, it's John Henry. I guess you say because he's a pile-driving man. That's it. <laughs> Lorena, just a few miles south of here, won the 2A state championship. And Henry, just about a one-man team on that group two years back. Second and nine. That one for Miles. Did he grab that one? I think he did. What a job on his back by Lee Miles. Miles had come off the line and again just did that little simple curl. 
The cushion is too far for TCU. Do you see TCU defender not even in the picture? That's Hickman, and when he turns up, Miles is sitting down and reaches back across his body to make that catch. It's called earning it. First and 10 at the 32. Three and a half minutes in the third quarter. Joe on the pitch. White did a good job hanging on to that because Anthony Hickman arrived just as soon as the ball did. Well, he did. He did a great job holding on. on. When he came to, comes back and looks that ball in, the first thing he sees when he turns around is Hickman. Watch this. He's looking the ball in. Bam! Well, that is a superb job of holding on to the football. And he just did hold on. Go! 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 Hickman Jr. from Aldine, 177 pounder. White again on second and six to the 25 yard line. Bolden on the tackle. That is Olatunji Bolden, which translated into the original African means rhythmic drummer. In Ann Arbor, Michigan. I can tell you right now, Dave, that Grant Taft and his Baylor team would like nothing better than to convert this third down, just continue, drive the football in, into the score, and then they just take over the momentum and all the rest of this football game and have the wind in the fourth quarter. White, perfectly defense option that time by both safeties. Rand, who makes the tackle, and Evans, who helped cut off a possible cutback avenue. Rand, like Hickman out of Aldine, leading tackler on this defensive unit last year, sixth leading tackler this year. Well, you get the feeling that they've gotten that confidence back in that kicking game with Ireland hitting those two field goals in two attempts. If he makes this one, they'll forget about last week and the week before. This is 44 yards and virtually no angle. And no good. Last knuckler was perfect as far as uh, his aim, very low. This one even lower than that, and Taft knew instantaneously he had hooked it and had no chance. This is a ground-oriented attack. Mims, Strait, Henry, and Joe, and uh, three of those four averaging right at six yards per carry. Made for different conditions. They like the day points up that fact. Vogler still in there. Shea took the ball on the shoulder. We hadn't seen him for the last two possessions. Back up tight end net for Mike Nowak, the intended receiver. Vogler had to get it off in a hurry. With the blitz bearing down and it's second and ten. Boy, if he had another couple seconds on that pass, he could have picked up Shipley on a crossing pattern. And he was breaking wide open. But as you said, Vogler had to throw the ball quickly to get rid of it. Vogler, of course, last year with that 690-yard game against Houston, briefly held the NCAA single game record. Last week against Rice, they got hot and they stayed hot in the second half. They trailed Rice and then won 39 to 28. Quick hitter to Monkins, or Lewis it is, with his first catch of the day to the 31. And they will still need a good six. Lewis, the high school basketball star, he played at Baltimore Dunbar on three state championship teams. And that is like a, if you're a high school football fan in Texas, playing at Odessa Permian or maybe Plano. That is a, as good a high school basketball program as you find anywhere. And, he not only did that, but had time to score 39 touchdowns on their football team. All out blitz caught by Blackwell for the first down. I don't know how he caught that I football. Don't either. That ball was drilled to him, but I want to tell you, his vision was taken away by the defensive back. Watch this, 86. Now watch when he catch, bam, right there he gets hit, he gets ripped down, and still picks up the first down. See how quickly the defender put his hand in front of him? 
That is great concentration by Blackwell. That was Michael McFarland. Blackwell flicked him off, first and ten. Two tight ends, Nowak, right, Blackwell left. Ball play, Modkins. Fumble, covered by Breedlove. That almost became the fifth Horn Frog turnover. And that is the final play of the third quarter. Baylor with the field goal to add to what was a 15-point halftime lead. It's 20-2 at Drench Floyd Casey Stadium in Waco, Texas. Dave Barnett and Dave Rowe with 15 minutes to go. TCU down 18 and down one quarterback. Tim Shave, the latest Horn Frog signal caller to be bit by the injury bug. So Matt Vogler with a heavily wrapped, burned left hand in charge. Under pressure, caught Michael Jackson. Has a first down at the Baylor 46-yard line. He goes for 16. McFarland on the tackle. Let's look at the third quarter statistics. First quarter, TCU a big edge. Baylor a slight edge at halftime. And a slight edge in total yardage. So the, the key number continues to be turnover. When the time of possession, too. Look at how long Baylor has had the football. Over 29 minutes. Vogler, good protection. Shipley knocked out of his hands. Good, solid hit by Frankie Smith, the right corner. And I don't think we'll see any more Tim Shea today. We have no official word on what the diagnosis is, but the right shoulder uh, took a blow midway third quarter. We've seen Vogler ever since. And that's not exactly uh, to say that TCU is barren at that position because we said he has a 690-yard game on his resume. That, that record didn't stand very long because David Klingler broke it a couple of weeks later. But he's got that kind of arm. Transferred from Auburn out of Tampa, Florida. And overthrown and almost intercepted by Ellison. It was too tall for Blackwell. Ellison almost did a Lee Miles on his back to bring that one in. It's amazing how many times they go to Blackwell, though. They just continually come back. Underway at the Cotton Bowl, Texas and SMU. And Peck with an early lead on Rice. Rice coming into that one three and three. Incomplete again, intended for Blackwell, but flags down, and we might get interference. Keith Caldwell celebrated, but he might have made interference contact with Kelly Blackwell. That's what they're going to call. Blackwell just comes off the line. When Vogler reads that it's a blitz, he's just going to try to hit Blackwell right quick. Bam, right there. And Caldwell is all over him. Celebrating a bit too soon. Boyd Dale's mic again not working. That was on a third and ten. And make it now first and ten, TCU. If you figure the Frogs good for maybe three possessions in the fourth quarter, they got to score on every single one of them beginning now. Vogler audibleizing. No blitz this time, but down he goes. Teddy Patton on the sack. 
when I was close to a face mask on Vogler, someone got a hand up in his face. Perhaps we can see it on Vogler. See if someone grabs his face mask or it just gets on top of his helmet. See the left hand right there on the face mask? Teddy Patton may have gotten away with one. Patton out of Cisco High School and Cisco Junior College. One of the four senior starters on the front four for Balin. Loss of nine. Again, no blitz, but again, pressure. And two call for Jackson, and then it almost caromed over to Shipley. And it was almost intercepted by Frankie Smith. Any number of possibilities on that one. And it'll be third and 19. Ogre's got to go a little bit farther downfield. He's got to find Shipley in that one-on-one -on -one situation where he breaks three. If I'm a Baylor defender, I'm going to give you that little short dump pass all day long. But they haven't really thrown that many. That's that's the bread and butter of people like Woodley, who are not available. Woodley with the fractured left elbow, in fact, out three weeks. Colors out two, three weeks with a sprained ankle that they thought might have been fractured against Rice last week. Botno bearing down on Vogel, who overthrows McPherson. What they tried to do that time is they tried to cut Botno. A big man that's agile has the ability. Once you try to cut him, he can just step over top of you, and that's what Pontno did, and ran right down Vogler's throat to force that pass. New punter, Mitch Ashley, a true freshman from Nacogdoches. That average, seven yards per kick lower than his all-state average as a senior last year. Forced that pop up, which takes a Baylor bounce, and Nowak downs it at the 38. Ashley hits that one for 12 yards. 13.02 to play, all Baylor. Ashley's 12-yard kick sets up Baylor in great shape at the 38, up 20 to 2 with 13:02 to play. That far from improving their record to 6 and 2, they say 9 and 2 ought to get us a pretty good bowl. Maybe not the Cotton, but even though we probably won't win the Southwest Conference, is no reason to cash in the rest of the season. And John Henry's latest carry carries. Just across the 40, Connolly on the tackle. Haven't had any information that Brad Smith is out, but we haven't seen him much this half, and Connolly's been in on several stops. Well, Baylor in this, in this situation, boy, this is, this is their forte. Drive the football, control the clock, run it down. Don't give it up via the fumble or any kind of mistake. Just take control of the football game. Keep it. Joe for the home run overthrows Bonner. That's the first time Bonner has been close enough to being open for Joe to even attempt that pass. Steve Reed had the coverage. And what they did that time, Dave, is they shortened up that pass. They didn't take as much time. And Joe, when he came down the line, faked it and quickly found Bonner. Actually, a little bit quicker than Bonner became open. Bonner this year, 28 grabs for an average of 26 yards per catch. That is 10 yards per catch better than the nearest average in the conference, which belongs to Marcus Grant of Houston. And two people moving here, Collins for TCU and Matt Gant for Baylor. Collins moved first, then Gant flinched. And Lloyd Dale will sort it all out. Well, I could read his lips. Dead ball, ball start, offense, five yards. Assuming Baylor holds on, this is their sixth 
winning season out of the last seven. Their best start since 1985 when they opened seven and one. This would make it six and two. So heavy pressure. Collins has him at the 21. Eighth sack of the year for the senior from Shreveport. Boy, and that's a double credit there. Credit to the defensive secondary for coverage and a credit to Collins to keep on coming from that back side for that sack. Third today for the Horn Frogs. And it forces a Brentham punting situation with 11.29 to go. They could really use a big return by Hickman who is more than capable. Or a block, and that's what they go for. They almost got it from McPherson. Hickman, did he touch the ball? Flag is down. Obviously, the Bears had the recovery. I think he was interfered with on the fair catch. You have to give him certain yardage around him and let him catch that fair catch. Even though he was running trying to catch it, you still have, once he signals, you have to get out of the way. That's it. Yes, it's an interference on a fair catch. You have to give him two yards all the way around him, and you'll see, even though he's running towards the football, you have to get out of his way. And David Loeb tried to avoid it, but he was too close. So TCU ball with 11-10 to play, and they need a bunch. Down 18. Tim Shade had been uh, just remarkable in replacing Leon Clay at quarterback until that bruised shoulder took him out for the rest of today. Seven of 18 for a guy who, coming into today, had completed about two-thirds of his passes. Today was his fourth start. Clay and Vogler between them, 15 starts, so they do have more experience out there in Vogler, but he covered his injury problem as well. Carry up near midfield on first down. Vogler was frying up some uh, dove or duck or something he'd been hunting and cooking it up and he had uh, his frying oil already and had a little fire problem and as he, he had the right idea as you're supposed to do he had baking powder and tried to throw it on but poor execution not enough baking power and he splashed it on himself instead of dousing the fire and it made a bad situation much worse now he's wearing a lineman's glove on that left hand. Ogler on the keeper that time. Up to the 43. There's that, that glove. That's a glove that most linemen wear. It protects the back of your hand, and you, you cut the fingers out. I guess offensive linemen cut the fingers out so they can hold. I never liked that, but Ogler obviously cuts the fingers out so he can get a grip on the football. And until this week, he couldn't even take a snap. Of course, a right-handed quarterback takes the brunt of the snap on the left hand, so you can understand that. Third and two. Of course, a must drive. Down 18 for TCU and Vogler changing the play. And again, they try to beat the blitz with the keeper, and they're at least a yard shy and have to one would think definitely go for it on fourth and one. It's an interesting way to beat the blitz. Quarterback keeper straight up the middle. Well, actually, it's called a goose play. You just come up and you give a signal to the center that you want a quarterback sneak. Now, I think what they're, they're trying to call timeout right now so they can discuss it and go on this fourth down. But what you do, David, is you come up there and you just put your hand under it and you just give the center a certain little... I guess you'd say a hand movement. He knows it. He run the quarterback sneak, and it does beat the blitz many times. They'll talk it over on fourth and one, trailing 20 to 2. Last time TCU had fourth and one, they went out of the wishbone and missed it by about a foot. They have fourth and one here, trailing by 18 points with 9.42 to play. And they've made their decision. 
Again, the wishbone with Michael Jackson, the fullback, and Modkins and Dickens behind him, and they go straight up the middle this time, and again, appear to come up short. The other time, they handed to one of the setbacks, and they did away with that option, but I don't think had what they needed. Boy, it is so hard to run inside on this Baylor defensive line. That was a strange call for me. I think I would have put, pulled the ball down, and it's easy to say this in hindsight, and tried that same point of attack where they were, they were almost successful had they cut it up inside. I think he's way short. Way meaning six <laughs> inches. Well, more than that, a lot more than that. And for the second time, on fourth down, the good old Baylor line holds firm. Frustrating day for TCU offensive coordinator Bob DeBest. And on that side, what a difference a couple of weeks makes. One way to keep the ball to hold down a passing attack like that at TCU, which is one of the best in the conference, is keep the ball away. And that's what Baylor's done so well today. This is predictable on first down. They usually go Henry up the middle. But that eats up time. We're down under nine and a half minutes. From Austin next week for the Red Raiders and the Longhorns. Check your local listings. We hope you can join us. If Texas defeats SMU in the Cotton Bowl this afternoon, they're still in the hunt for the Cotton Bowl with only one conference defeat. That coming at Little Rock by a point last week. Bill Keeper tackled by Anderson. Today, when I look at the size of these Baylor linemen, I think of that little conversation that we had with Grant Tapp yesterday about weight training. When did weight training come in into uh, his picture? He said he... Remember back when he was about 1962 or three, he went over to a cafeteria and filled the cans, the food cans up with concrete and made barbells for his players. He said, that's the first time I realized that weight training had to be an integral part of football. Today, everybody has weight training. Tells you two things about Pat, ahead of his time and can make do with less, which he's had to do until this year with that new training center. Joe on the quarterback draw. Look out. Hickman with an angle knocks him out. But he's got a first down at the 27 after a gain at 27. Now the difference between this type of a quarterback draw and the quarterback sneak is that you give your lineman just about a tenth of a second more to turn the defensive lineman and you find the seam. See, Joe takes the ball, he steps back a couple steps. Now he allows the linemen to get their blocks. Now he looks and sees the scene, walks up through it, and again, picks up big yardage. That's the difference. Good look at the water kicking up from the drenched super turf. Well, full turf. Brett White inside the 10. It'll be first and goal, Baylor. And again, Hickman saved the touchdown. They pick up 48 yards on consecutive games. I was felt as a defensive player that quick hitting play has a lot of, it just is, has a more effect on a defensive lineman because you don't get a chance to shed blocks. He proves that on that, just kind of pops up through there, and before you can recover, he's into the secondary. Pittsburgh nosing back in front of that East Carolina team. Henry to the four. Connolly drives him back, second and goal. Oklahoma taking out some frustrations. And A&M adding a touchdown to what was an early lead. Talk about the what-ifs for TCU. They're one point away from a perfect record coming into this game. Same is true for A&M. One point loss to Tulsa, which... As every week goes by, it's more and more mystifying. How did that happen? Up the middle for the touchdown is John Henry. His second today. 
What a different type of a handoff for J.J. Joe. He flashed one way, turned completely around, and handed the ball on the other side. Henry, 23 carries, 63 yards. The yard per carry average will jump out, but for what they've needed from him, he's been there. Ireland for the extra point, no good. He hooked it wide left, and it's still 26 to 2. What happens on this play? If you're the middle linebacker and you're keying the, the quarterback, see the action right there where he turns all the way back around? That freezes the middle linebacker for just a second and opens up the hole. Tremendous block by Scott Barron. Boy, center. absolutely great block by Barron. Back after this from Southwest Airlines. Baylor puts it away on John Henry's second scoring run of the afternoon, 26-2. And he's done his job in that they have not missed Robert Strait one bit. Strait with the ankle problem on top of the surgical knee, which kept him out of action only 11 days. And we'll see if he can return next week. This is Kobe Mori. Outstanding kick return man for about 30 on this one. Baylor's latest scoring drive, six plays and 57 yards, and it didn't take long because Joe kept for 27. And right after that, a 21-yard gain by uh, Greg White, and that was the lion's share of that 57 yards. USC on the board at Notre Dame in the third quarter. And Texas on the board with a rare first-half touchdown. Might have been from the defense. <laughs> Vogler, well delivered with a flag down under a heavy rush to Mike Nowak, the backup tight end. Lee Bruder came on the blitz, and we might get roughing, we will. Personal foul, Baylor. Not much action this year for Bruder, rather by nagging the injury, shooting from flying. I don't know what we're waiting for. We can't hear him. <laughs> but we do know it's personal foul on the roughing the passer. So into Baylor territory. TCU first down to 47. Clock rolls, 640 and counting. Dickens is the setback. Vogler on the play pick. Blackwell, great reaching grab. Almost a trap, but he brought it in at the 38. What a day he's had. And what an adjustment on that catch to come completely against your body and reach back and come up with that catch. And he has such great hands. He never bobbles the ball. He reaches completely around him. On the back side, look at this, right about two inches off the ground clean. Vogler <laughs> second and one. Pocket holes. That time Blackwell claiming interference. He almost oh. made a one-handed grab. I want to tell you, you talk about interference. I watched him come off the line. <laughs> You would not believe what happened to him. He got almost completely tackled on the play. Curtis Hafford, a man that uh, was all over Blackwell, and a wet ball and all, almost <laughs> made a great catch. Well, when he ran into Hafford, Hafford just almost tackled him, put his arms around him, tried to pull him down. No doubt that was pass interference, but they got away with it. So third and one. And Vogler on the keeper should have the first as we go under six minutes. 
Well, the TCU uh, schedule <coughs> commences with SMU at Fort Worth next week. Then they've got a Thursday night game at home against A&M. They go to Austin November 16th against Texas, back home against Houston November 23rd. And Wacker is right about one thing. He says the only way we're going to make people forget about our November history is to start winning in November. Because in the past, we have not been good enough to beat the likes of Texas, Houston, and A&M. They're 1-20 in, in November since 1984. Which comes Vogler out of one tackle and lets it fly for Dickens. Under throw and intercepted by Curtis Capper at the one. This ball was so high and he could just almost circle under it like a center fielder. The ball just ca came off his hand and just fluttered so high. Watch when he gets outside the pocket here. You'll see the ball just has just has no trajectory on, no sting. The ball goes way up high. You can see it just wobbling as it comes down. Look how high it is. Curtis Hafford with the interception, 5.28 remaining. Well, it's getting closer every week, and the anticipation builds relentlessly for the Dave Rowe All-Conference team coming November 30th. The Bocce Koch all name candidates, we have a dual entry from TCU, Rock and Royal West, who should be some casting director's dream. They should go from Winona straight to Hollywood when they finish their playing career. Robert Wagner for Baylor, and take your pick of a half dozen Millers. Oh boy, you got five Millers on this Baylor team. New quarterback, Steve Needham. J.J. Joe done for the day, and Needham from his own one, trying to create a little room out to the two. Needham, junior from Plano, started quite a bit last year after Brad Gable Went down with an injury, and then after Joe went down. High school state championship linebacker and quarterback at Plano. <laughs> Under five minutes we go. Loeb is the new fullback. So Henry probably done for the day. Likewise, and this is Craig Stevens. This is the fourth tailback we've seen for Baylor, sophomore from Pasadena Doby, which produced Trevor Cobb. That's that's not a bad <laughs> that's backfield not, tandem. No, that certainly is not. Yeah, you, know, you get the feeling I do as a as a player that Baylor came out and did what they had to do. Their defense came out and really controlled this football game. Their offense really didn't didn't come up to a complete cohesive unit, but they were able to move the football. They've been able to score some points, but really their defense came out and played extremely hard. Greg Stevens off tackle will not have the first down. Hit hard by Mike Moulton, best young linebacker, freshman on this TCU defensive unit out of Arlington, Sam Houston. And it'll be fourth down and four with 348 and counting. Hickman should get this punt in Baylor territory. Now what Baylor wanted to do, they have done right down the line. They played their type of football, hold steady, create the turnovers, grind it out on offense. And more than that, erase the psychological scar. Great punt under pressure by Brentham. They're caught at midfield, 42-yarder. A lot of teams would uh, crater for the rest of the year after what happened to Baylor against Rice. And then to be blown out, really in the span of about two or three minutes in the second quarter against A&M last week, but they have rebounded. And that's quite a tribute to Grant Tapp and his staff to get focused back on the football game. If you told them in the beginning of the season, hey, coach, You've got a chance to be 9-2. and two. What do you think? He'd say, boy, we take it in a minute. But when they, when they lost those two games back-to-back, -back, everybody said, boy, what's happened? And he just put all those distractions out of his mind. David Lewis on the quick hitter, tackled by Ellison. Clock rolls. 
As we mentioned, this is probably the toughest week of coaching that Pat is likely to have this year or most years. And now Wacker faced with a tough week of coaching. Shipley reaching behind him for the first down to the 35, and again Ellison makes the tackle. When you think, what if he had thrown that ball out in front of Shipley with his speed? He was downfield in a hurry. Now we're in hurry-up offense. TCU trying to score. They're going to call every play from the line now. Five wideouts. It takes a while to relay the message. Jump pass, and again, Blackwell almost makes a one-handed miracle grab. McFarland was on. It's the first team Baylor defense is still out there, trying to stay sharp. Well, if McFarland doesn't hit this ball, Blackwell is going to come down with it. Just a quick cross on the read and the blitz. Watch when he reaches up with that left hand. If McFarland doesn't hit that, he's going to bring that ball in. Blackwell moving up the Southwest Conference career reception chart. And that one to Dickens to the 17. Had only one catch for a loss of five yards on the year before the day. That's a big one of the ACC you just saw, Clemson at NC State. Clock rolling again, 207, 206 and counting. Warren Frogs won at least one touchdown to come out of this thing. Haven't been in it really since it was 10 to 2. Briefly it was 3 to 2, Baylor. Vogler on the fade. That should be Shipley's favorite pattern. He's 6'5", and the tallest Baylor secondary people are 5'11", Caldwell and Ellison. And that ball just got away from Vogler. It just floated on him. Again, it could be because of that hand when he takes that snap. If he's he puts that left hand in. As you said, Dave, that's what takes the pop on the hand. It's got the sting. A minute 49. And the other side on the fade, and this one caught by Dickens for the touchdown. Boy, I want to tell you what Dickens did that time. He looked off. He just looked away. And when his defensive back turned and looked at him, the defensive back never thought the pass was thrown to him. Kind of like looking off the fake uh, pass in basketball. Did an excellent job. Well, that was a costly touchdown, as it turned out, because quick guard Benny Scott limping at the top of your screen for the TCU sideline. And he was beating the turf in pain before he was helped to his feet. Senior from Dabal, the 305-pounder. The touchdown comes with 1.42 to play. We see Jeff Wilkinson on for the extra point. And he's good. I would think you might as well practice your two-point conversion. I certainly would think that. Let me show you the play. Let's see if we can see Dickens. He's going to be in the left of your screen. And when he looks at the defender, looks at him, what he does is he just kind of looks him off. And the defender thinks, well, it's not being thrown. See, he does, he looks him off. Then when he turns and looks back at the ball, the ball is there for the touchdown. Afford had good position, but didn't turn around in time. 142 to play. Touchdowns on 23 carries. It has been a team effort offensively and defensively for Baylor. So out of a lot of candidates, John Henry, our Southwest Airlines player of the game. Well, two years ago, this game ended 27 to 9. Baylor, Kirk McCarley, a statistician, points that back out. It was one point off of Deja Vu all over again at Floyd Casey Stadium, but that much time for me. Gray Beacon to kick for TCU. Charlie Durker has been our spotter this afternoon. David Handler, our producer. Johnny Tyus, our director. 
Look for the onside kick. Might as well practice that right now. They don't get the big hop, and Baylor recovers at their 47. Reggie Miller. Baylor had some hands up on that line expecting just what they got. The executive producer of Raycom is Peter Rolf, senior coordinating producer and director of today's game, Johnny Tyus. Southwest Conference Football, produced by David Handler, our technical director, Brad Sheldon, our associate producer, Lee Friday, and our associate director, Charlotte Spivey. Reggie Miller was shaken up on that play. The man that covered the onside kick has to be helped off the field. And Needham giving to Stevens with 1.32 and counting. And it's a happy homecoming. If there's a downside to this Southwest Conference race, it is, I guess, that no one's undefeated, uh, which pretty much takes you out of the national championship picture but on the other hand the depth is such that you might have more than the usual amount of bowl teams and this Baylor team should certainly be one of those. Stevens to the 42. Okay. Be definitely be one. TCU has a shot. Rice has a shot. Texas has a shot. Certainly Baylor. Grant Tapp will win his 119th game at Baylor in 47 more seconds. Stevens again. Baylor's not had a week off all year. They have Arkansas at Fayetteville next week, and they finally get a break November 9th. They close out with Texas Tech here on the 16th at Texas on the 23rd. And Jim Wacker will get ready for his always arduous month of November with a 5-2 and two record. And the second conference loss for the Frogs in the timeout, traditionally meaning the end of their Cotton Bowl hopes. It has happened once. Two losses, one to the conference, and one to the Cotton Bowl. Not expected to be the case this year. But at TCU, that doesn't mean you stop playing. Any bowl will do. They last went in 84 to the now defunct move on his bowl. They started off so well, and like you said, one point, and they would have come into this game undefeated. They are having a good season. Yes, they have, uh, they really have their work in store ahead of them. I think a lot will depend on the condition of Shade's shoulder. No word on, a, on the extent of it, but uh, we saw him with ice on it. Haven't seen him much in the second half. Vogler's hand should get better, but that's not much depth at that position. You've got a little-used junior, Darren Schultz, and a true freshman, Scott McLeod. That's it behind Vogler. So for TCU to have much of a November, you got to figure Shade's got to get better quick. And Woodley and Colors also, neither of whom we saw today, also need to heal in a hurry. Well, they certainly are high on Colors, though. They think he is really their star. Shade with the jacket on. Looks like they've got the uh, the ice now off that right shoulder. If so, that's a good sign. Well, and again, with his hand on his hip, that's a good sign, too. He doesn't have it up against his body like it would be in, a, say, a sling position. What a future. 6'5", 220, his arm, his poise, his ability to read things, unlimited. <laughs> Fourth and one. Needham on the blind bootleg in a foot race with Tony Rand, and he probably will have the first. He definitely will have the first. That's the 41. Right in front of Tap.
TCU has one more timeout if they choose to use it. Well, it's been a hard week for Jim Wacker with he had a sore back and was I think he even missed one day of practice this week with that back. Had a brace on when we saw him. So maybe that's why he's not as animated as he usually is. Whistles before the snap. And then the clock stop with eight seconds. Head ball motion. So the inevitable drawn out a little more. Well, I think, Dave, you really have to hand it to Grant Taft and his staff again to come in and just to totally focus on a football game. He knew that this TCU team is a high-scoring team. They've shown it. they put a lot of points on the scoreboard. And to go and do what he did, a lot of people would question that because, as I said, you don't scrimmage during the middle of the season, not full go. He went everything live. And Stevens one more time, and that'll do it. And on that excellent point, it's over. Baylor wins it 26-9. to They break their two-game losing streak, and they're 6-2 and two and 3-2 and two in the conference. TCU 5-2, and 2-2 two, two and two in the league. And the two deans of the South Coast Conference meeting at midfield. For his defense to hold this TCU offense to one touchdown and that in, in the point of the game where it was all decided was a remarkable defense. Especially with the momentum. Actually went to TCU first with the scoring of that that quick safety, then they got the ball right back, but his defense really played strong football today. He's going to be very proud of him.